You see, the prophecies recorded in the scriptures have such accuracy, such detail, you just can't imagine how it could have happened without the supernatural power of God. For example, if you read Zechariah 9, verse 9, let's look at that, Zechariah 9, verse 9. That's just one prophecy regarding Jesus. There was such prophecies that he would be betrayed, he would be sold for so much, so much money, 30 pieces of silver. All the details were given to such accuracy that it cannot be but a prophecy from God. Only God can predict the future, not man. Man may try to predict future, but only God can predict future accurately, correctly. Now, there's this question many times people ask. How do you know? See, the prophecies given there are so accurate, so right. How do you know they were not written after the fact? How can you prove you are here 2,000 years later? How can you prove that what's written there is not written after the fact? How can you know that for sure? We can know that for sure because of the Jews, the Jewish nation. God caused blindness and the nation of Jews that we might believe oh the marvelous wisdom of God it talks about it in Romans 11th chapter Romans 11th chapter talks about the great plan of God it says they were broken off that you might be grafted in it is talking about exactly the same thing the Jews don't believe in the Messiah they don't believe and yet they protect the prophecy concerning the Messiah. That is proof enough for us to know that the prophecy is preserved in its entirety. Because somebody who does not believe in those prophecies has protected it as the word of God. You now the word of God is protected by the Jews to a great extent. They would copy the scriptures very carefully. It is a profession of the scribes in those days they would write it so meticulously, copy the scripture so meticulously, every time they had to come to the point where they have to write the name of God, Jehovah, they would not write it unless they washed themselves first. They purified themselves and write it down. After they write it, they consider themselves unholy. They go back and wash themselves and come back and re rewrite the scriptures. And it would take years and years to copy the scriptures, but they preserved the scriptures for us. So we know how much care they took to preserve the scriptures and they deny Christ. So we know the prophecy written about Christ is accurate and it's not written after the fact. Also we see many other reasons why this is the word of God because some of the doctrines written here in the scriptures are not some things that human minds can, can conjure up. It's not possible for human minds to think such things. The doctrine of Trinity, the doctrine of salvation, doctrine of grace. Now these are the things that human beings cannot come up with. It's not really possible for human minds to describe salvation by faith. The only, only religion, if you look at all other religions, Paul Walker says there are only two religions. Sorry. There are only two religions, Paul Walker says. One is the religion of works and the religion of grace. Only two religions. Every other religion in the world talks about religion, salvation by works. Only Christianity talks about salvation by grace. It's unique in that sense. See, the doctrine of Trinity is something that human minds cannot conjure up. See, there is a story I just wanted to give a little a small uh, interlude here, a story about uh, a third grade teacher. She called up uh, one of the student's moms and say, she said, I want to tell you something. 
unusual that happened in my class today. And the mom was a little bit nervous. So what did, what did my son do in third grade, right? So she was a little bit concerned. What would he have done? And she said, you know, I usually, today's class was something unusual. I never had this experience before. I've taught this class many, many years. But what happened today with your son was something unique. Never happened. And she went on. See, usually I tell a story. I start with this small story, and I tell the students to complete the ending. It goes this way. There is an ant and a grasshopper. Grasshopper. And the ant works really hard all summer long, tries to keep, preserve food, store food. And the grasshopper was just fooling around, wasting away time. Didn't do anything for future just wasted every time, just enjoyed uh, the summer season. And when it came, time for the, the winter time came, they went back into their small, small roofs, you know, the ant hills, and they were keeping, protecting themselves from the season. And the grasshopper came to the ant and said, see, I don't have any food, I'm starving, I'm dying, can you help me? And she stops there and she says, now I want you all students to complete the story. Then way at the back, your son actually raised his hand and said, uh, teacher, can I write a diagram? Can I paint a diagram, uh, uh, sketch a diagram? And she said, well, you can, but first you finish the story, and then you want to write your, your picture, it's fine. And so when students come back to me, they say one or two things. They say, okay, the ad said, okay, let us share the food. And so they shared the food and they survived the winter and everybody was, both were happy. Then the second group of people would normally say, you did not work for your food. And if we both share, we both might die. So I can't share my food with you. And so the grasshopper died and the ant lived. So that was the another ending. But what your son did was something I had never had in so many years of my teaching. And what did my son do? <laughs> she said, well, the ant gave all its food to the grasshopper and so the grasshopper survived the winter but the ant died and below that he put a picture of three crosses and he said so that was unusual to me i never had that happen you know that's unusual the concept of salvation is unusual could not have been thought of created by human minds that was so unusual You know, the precepts, the laws written in the Word of God also have God's signature, God's seal on them. The precepts, the commandments given by God are divine. You can see that very clearly. Blessed are the pure in heart, but they shall see God. Talking about purity of God. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's not something you can see in any humanly human ideas. If thine enemy smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the left also, the other also. Those things you don't find in human philosophy. Human philosophy is it's, it's a one-upmanship. Survival of the fittest. If you don't you, if you don't fight for your cause, you will lose. That's human nature. But the seal of God, you can see that here in the scripture, which proves to us that it is the word of God. You know, the purity of God's word also proves that it is the word of God. No man can accuse another of having followed the scripture and leading an evil, sinful life. There is nobody who can, who can accuse you and say that you are leading a sinful life because you are following the scripture. The scriptures are holy. Well, there are many, many reasons we can give to why the scriptures are from the word of God, are the word of God. But you know, there are supernatural effects from the scripture that proves to us that it is the word of God there are supernatural effects. 
know the supernatural effects are. See, the Word of God searches the hearts, it says in Hebrew 4.12. This is some memory words, right? Hebrew 4 verse 12. Somebody recite it. verse 19 I think it is where Jesus enters the room after resurrection he entered the room the doors were closed Jesus entered the room you know many times we might shut our hearts hide ourselves from the external world no one knows what's inside but God knows when you read the scriptures it comes out God can enter closed doors. The Word of God can enter closed doors. There's no shield. It's God's supernatural power. It is, exposes the thoughts and intents of heart. You know, in Jeremiah 17, verse 10, it says, let's look at that, Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Searches the hearts, the inner inner motives, secrets of the heart, That's the same way the scripture does. You know, when the scripture was read, to the Old Testament saints in Israel, the nation of Israel, Josiah was crying and weeping. You now the supernatural power of God, the supernatural power of God, when the word of God is read to you, really touches your heart you will cry the conscience is touched conscience is disturbed you know when Felix was listening to Apostle Paul he trembled it says he trembled Felix trembled when he was listening to Paul about judgment about uh, righteousness about sins he trembled you now the scripture has the power it uh, disturbs your conscience when Peter preached the sermon before Pentecost, after Pentecost, they were cut to the heart. And the Bible says all the Jews were cut to the heart. And they said, what shall we do? That power has, the scripture has that power. You know, the scripture not only disturbs the conscience, troubles our minds, but also gives comfort to us. The scripture does give us comfort. There are many, many portions in the scripture where we find it, where, where the comforting power of the scripture is given to us. You know, for the sake of time, I will skip through some of that. Also, the scripture has the converting power. You know, the scripture has a power to change your lives. There is a story about a, a thief that's a bandit. I think uh, I might have shared this with you before a bandit in the Chambal Valley in Madhya Pradesh, Chambal Valley, some of you know. So they attack homes, bandits attack homes and they rob the homes and bring whatever they can to their uh, dens and then they use it. Then after it's over they go back and attack another home, set of homes. Once they attacked a home, an engineer from South India, he happened to be a Christian and he had the Bible in there, he didn't know about it. But he attacked that home and he, he brought everything but when he saw the scripture, he saw the Bible, he had the, you know, it's, uh, usually it's a fine quality paper, it's unusual to find in India, very fine quality of paper. So he thought, oh, this is something I can use from smoking. So he took it with me, himself. You know, he would, every day he would tear one page, then he would uh, put the tobacco powder in it, wrap it, and then smoke. 
Every day he was tearing one page and he was smoking. He was smoking away the Bible. But suddenly one day he realized that the script, the book that he was tearing pages from was something that he could read, written in his language. So he started to read it. He was a bandit, you know, bandit from Madhya Pradesh, Campbell Valley bandit. But he read and he was convicted of his sin and he turned around from his uh, lifestyle. He became a Christian. He became a changed man. You know, the power in the Word of God is such that it will change you. The Word of God has such supernatural power. There are many people who testify to that. There are drug addicts. Even here we find, we find people testifying to the power of God and saying that it was the scripture which changed my life. You know, the scripture changes the life of people. That proves the, the supernatural power origin of God. Okay, so... You know, we have the example of Paul. The example of Paul. Great example of Paul. You know, he was somebody who attacked the Christians and he himself became a Christian because of the power of God. You know, the gospel message is contrary to the state taste of human mind. You know, what does the gospel message uh, promise you? It does not promise you a lot of prosperity. It does not promise you many good things. Of course, the word of God gives you eternal life. But persecution in this life. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 16, chapter 24. If any man come after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. Meaning that he who follows me has to follow, take up his cross. That was a promise given. But yet we find that there were so many people who were willing to follow Christ and to give their lives for Christ. There were many martyrs. All of them believed the word of God. Gave up their lives. You know, the scriptures was not patronized by any king until Constantine came along in the 16th century. All along, it was attacked and attacked and attacked. And yet it survived. The scripture has the power. It is supernatural. Also, let's change the topic. It says, why is the word of God called the sword? It is called the sword for many reasons. You know, it is called the sword because by using it, people have overcome many, many things. You know, it, there were many Goliaths who came to attack. And there are many Davids who used the smooth stones from the word of God to kill the Goliaths. Many, many instances, not just one. Many, many instances. Well, the sword of God applies to the children of God as a powerful weapon. You know, it's uh, the children of God are attacked by the sword of God before they become Christians. Then they become children of God. You know, when Peter preached that message on the day of Pentecost, many people were cut to the heart by the word that was spoken. It applies to the children of God. Also, the sword applies to the persecutors as well. We see that in Second Peter, second chapter, twelfth verse. We will not turn there for the sake of time. But it's, it applies to the, those who persecute those as a sword. Its power is revealed against the persecutors. Also, the sword of God, its power is revealed against those who seduce, those who propagate false doctrine. You know, it's a false doctrine. People try to use the word of God for their personal selfish goals and the word of God comes back to haunt them to attack them also it is as a defensive weapon you know it's uh, when you hear false doctrines you want you want to use the word of God to find out what is the truthfulness of that doctrine then using the word of God you will be able to attack false doctrines. The sword is also used against lusts, 
against temptations. You know, it's, uh, it says, uh, William Gurnall says this, he said, uh, the man was first attacked by his own rib. Devil used his own rib to beat him. You know, devil used his own rib to beat him. So the inner selfish motives, lusts, our own sinful nature is greater than outside influences like the false doctrine, the persecution. All of them are much smaller compared to the inner sinful nature. But the word of God is available to us to attack and to kill that. You know, word of God prepares us to face persecution. The sword of God has to be used to face persecution. You know, we read that at the very beginning, unless your law had been my delight, I would have perished. The words I can't quite remember exactly, but it is to that extent, unless the word of God is our delight, we would have suffered or died long ago. So the word of God is used to face persecution. But first of all, before we face persecution, we must be convinced that it is the whole truth of God. Let's uh, read just one portion of scripture, First Thessalonians, first chapter, verse 5. Here we see the gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. Word of God has power. And in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance. Now there must be much assurance. The word of God should mean what it says to you. And you must be fully convinced. Fully convinced about the truth of the word of God. That is the only time when you can use it your advantage. If you are not fully convinced, if you don't have that much assurance, you will not be able to use the word of God as a weapon with a full power. That full power is not available to you unless you have that much assurance. You must have that assurance. Otherwise, if you face persecution, you will fall away. So when you have that goodwill type of uh, attitude let's do something good you know for God's sake let's do something good if you have such an attitude you will fall away because if you don't have that much assurance there is not the power of the Holy Spirit within you also we must fear God more than man unless we have that attitude the power of God and the power of the Word of God will not become real to us. There is this attitude that we must obey God more than man. We see that in Matthew 10th chapter, verse 28. But let's go on. We also must mortify the fleshly lusts and to fortify our faith. We must mortify the deeds of the flesh with the power of the word of God. You know, there are many times, many, many times that I faced temptation and the lusts of the flesh. Every time I quoted the scripture, I could see somebody running away. This was literally true in my life. I could see somebody running out the door. When I was quoting the scripture, I could just feel it, somebody running out the door. When I had the temptation and the lust attacking me, and I quoted the scripture, they would run away from us as if somebody running is running away from the room from your presence you know James talks about it resist the devil and he will flee from you such things happen when you are able to use the word of God as a sword we must use the word of God properly you know the word of God is, is like a plumb line the word of God is effective in bringing you to Christ but it does not stop there. You know, it's like a, a, a 
constructor, a contractor, when he builds the house, he uses the plumb line to put the foundation. I think these days they use levels, right? They use levels to make sure everything is correct, fully aligned well, all right angles. But not only at the time of the foundation, but all the way to the time where they complete the ceiling, they use the plumb line or the level. So the word of God has to be used all along in a Christian's life. The way to use the word of God is to allow the Holy Spirit to direct our thoughts. Pray to God, to ask God to direct our thoughts, to give us understanding. Romans 12 verse 2 talks about not being conformed to this word. Thank you. Okay, so the, the way to use the word of God is a sword. There are many, many guidelines given in the scriptures as to how to use it as a word of God. As a powerful sword is to allow the Holy Spirit to give us guidance on using the word. To not use reason. We, of course, have to use reason. We have to use our mind, but to not have presupposition, presupposed notions. When we come to the word of God, we must have open attitude. Whatever the word of God teaches is final authority. We must accept that. You know, these Sadducees, when they came to Jesus, they had this preconceived notion that there is no resurrection. And they wanted to prove that point to Jesus. You cannot, you cannot understand the deeper truths of God. He said, Jesus talked about it at that time and he said, you do not know the scriptures, neither the power of God. And that's why you don't believe in resurrection. You know, so if you want to understand deeper truths from the Word of God, you do not come to the Word of God with preconceived notions. Also, don't patronize any specific doctrine. Say, okay, I believe in predestination. Or I believe in absolute perfection. And then try to prove that point from the scripture. It does not work that way. You allow the Holy Spirit of God to teach you what you need to understand and to know. You know, you must pray much to God for understanding. You know, all the learning that Daniel had, all his learning, all that he got, all the revelation he understood from the scriptures was much less until he knelt down to pray. When he prayed, he understood the future of Israel and the future of all believers just because he prayed and he fasted and he prayed and he got a lot more out of that prayer compared to all the study and all the work all the exercises he was doing as a student of the Word of God so prayer has much power in it prayer has so much power it's direct communication with God you will get much more power much more revelation much more understanding of the scriptures when you spend time in prayer Also, we must compare scripture with scripture. Comparing scripture with scripture is a very healthy attitude for a believer who wants to use the word of God as a sword. You must compare scripture with scripture. You must be able to compare things that are clearly revealed with things that are not clearly revealed. You know, in Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, things that are revealed belong to God, belong to unto us. Secret things belong unto the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong unto us. So whatever is revealed to us will be explained to us very clearly. We can understand very clearly, comparing scripture with scripture, because scriptures cannot contradict themselves. Scripture is not contradictory. Everything is very clear and very consistent. Also, sometimes it is good to follow the faith of the man of God. You must know the walk of a man of God. Because it says in Hebrew, Hebrew 13th chapter, I think, it talks about uh, following the faith of those who are over you, considering the end of their conversation. Meaning, don't blindly follow your leaders. Understand what they are doing, what they teach. Does it match? what they do. If they match, then try to follow them. 
it is also a good thing to follow the leader provided the leader is in God's will consult men of God sometimes it is good to understand you know, in the multitude of counselors there is safety in the multitude of counselors there is safety it's good to consult you know there are many many things that we can uh, understand about the word of God but there are some of these things that we must know some of the basic things that I talked about using the word of God as, as a sword as a powerful weapon to overcome you know to pull down the strongholds of the devil to pull down the strongholds of the devil we must use the word of God okay let us pray